I love preaching after something like that. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at several different verses this morning. Hope you have your connection with your sermon handout inside of it. Pull that out as well because we're going to reference many passages of Scripture this morning because there's power in the Word of God. And we're going to look at the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because the evidence is overwhelming. I'm in a series on Sunday morning entitled, I Believe. Credo is the Latin for I believe, so a creed is a belief statement. And so the Apostles' Creed, we've been walking through each doctrine of the Apostles, original Apostles' Creed, not to study a creed, but to study the basics of our faith because every one of these statements are rooted in God's holy word, in holy scripture. And if there's some things that we need to all agree on, these are the main things. If we want to disagree on some things, we'll study Revelation on Wednesday night in several months. You can come, we'll disagree on Revelation, but on, some, on your interpretation of Revelation. But if we're going to agree on the main aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ, these are the things we must agree on. Here's how the Apostles' Creed goes. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth. I believe that God, first part of the Trinity, created the heavens and the earth. I believe in the second part of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And this morning we're going to focus on the third day he rose from the dead. Next Sunday he ascended to heaven is what we'll focus on. And sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Third part of the Trinity, I believe in the Holy Spirit. One holy church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe. These are very important statements that are the crucial aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's written in order of how it comes in the scripture that first God created the heavens and the earth. Gen then God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to be punished by the wrath of God for the sins that we should be punished for from the wrath of God. He really was crucified. He really did die. We studied that last week. They buried him in a tomb but on the third day, he rose back to life. Then he sent the Holy Spirit in Acts to indwell believers at the moment they were saved by Almighty God to live in and through them. And we'll look at that as we get to that in the Apostles' Creed. Billy Graham once told a news reporter, and it was quoted in a magazine as well. Billy Graham said this, If I were an enemy of Christianity, I would aim right at the resurrection because that's the heart of Christianity. What's crucial about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we have no hope. No hope whatsoever. And so as you heard Donnie just so beautifully sing about Jesus rising from the grave, sometimes it can't even contain ourselves to think about the grave could not hold him. And the grave cannot hold us as well. Because as Jim prayed earlier, we are in Christ. And when Christ rose, we will one day rise with him to meet him in the air and to spend eternity with him in a place called glory. I'm not a lawyer, Gary. Dreamed of being one when I was a little kid. I love to argue sides of a case. I'm going to approach this message as if I were a lawyer and I'm not to look at the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes I read things about what's put in the paper and sometimes it's pretty funny. I found this about a lawyer arguing a case. His question was this, I show you exhibit three and ask you if you recognize that picture. And the response was, that's me. To which the lawyer said, were you present when the picture was taken? I hope we look at this from a different aspect this morning, as Gary would, as a, as a good lawyer, would look at this this morning. Let's talk about first that Jesus 
promise that he would come back from the grave. Not once, many times, Jesus, the God-man, said he would die and on the third day be raised back to life. He predict predicted that. He prophesied that. Matthew 16, 21 is the first one. We'll be in Acts chapter 1, verse 3 in a moment. That's the main passage I want you to see this morning. Matthew 16, 21, from that time, from the time of his ministry, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. He really did die and be killed and on the third day be raised. Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. He'll be raised on the third day, and they were greatly distressed. They were focused on the fact that he said he'd be killed. They weren't focused on the fact that he said he would rise from the grave. Matthew chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. Matthew 26, verse 32. Jesus says, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Over and over again in the scriptures, Jesus said he would be crucified, he would be killed, he would really die, and on the third day, be raised back to life. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, then all that Jesus said was a lie. And Jesus was a false prophet. And we know that's not true. His integrity, his believability, his character is on the line if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not true. Let's be honest this morning. It's either true or it's not. It's either the greatest fact in history that we stake our hope in Jesus Christ on or it's the greatest farce in history and we have no hope if Jesus Christ did not rise from the grave. So since it's the most important part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe that God will give us many proofs to back it up. And he does in his holy word. Acts 1 verse 3. Acts 1, verse 3. Dr. Luke, analytical person, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God worked through him to write Luke in the book of Acts. He records, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. Some translations say by convincing, many convincing proofs. Which is interesting because in the Greek language, the word convincing is not there. The words many proofs are there. Why? Because if it's a proof, it's convincing. But we had to add that word so people understand it's something that's really true. A convincing proof. Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. God says through Luke in Acts 1-3 that God gave many proofs evidences of the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. We have to believe it because there's too many proofs there not to believe it. In fact, the best rendering from the Greek is not even the word into English we say is proof. The best rendering from the Greek into English is a sure sign. A positive sign. It's obvious that he had to rise from the grave based on the evidence. So we're gonna look at that evidence this morning because we, we need to know what we believe and why we believe it so we can share with the lost and dying world who do not believe that the resurrection is true, that it is, so they'll put their trust in Jesus Christ and him alone because Jesus Christ alone is the only one that can save. Why should I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Number one, his body was buried. He had to die before he could be raised back to life. We talked about the importance of his death last Sunday. Many people want to talk about the fact they believe he didn't die, that he actually swooned or he fainted. Why? Because they don't want to believe in the resurrection. So if they can say he didn't die, they can say he didn't rise back from the grave. John 19, 34, we looked at last week. 
but one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Health experts, this was in the Journal of the American Medical Society, said for that to occur, that the spear would go into his heart, not just the pericardium surrounding the heart, they would go through the right lung, through the pericardium, into his heart for blood and water to flow as proof, as a sure sign, as evidence that Jesus was already dead. It says in the Journal of the American Medical Society, accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Why is it recorded in Scripture that they put a spear into his side and blood and water flowed so we would have convincing proof, a sure sign that Jesus was dead so when he was raised back to life, it wasn't that he passed out and then came to again. We read Matthew 27 last week about what they did with the body of Jesus Christ. Let's just say, what if he didn't really die? We know he did. But what if he just passed out? Well, remember Matthew 27 last week that they took 75 pounds of spices and they wrapped his body. So they would wrap his body with one piece of linen and go around his body and they would put spices in between it. They would even put spices in his mouth and in his nose and they would wrap him really tight. 75 pounds of spices. So they wrapped him that way. They put him in pretty much an airtight rolled a stone over the tomb and he resuscitated because he wasn't dead. He didn't suffocate after they wrapped him and all that. And he unwrapped himself. I don't know if you've ever seen mummification processes. He unwrapped himself. Then with those hands that were nail pierced to the cross, he pushed that stone away that took 14 or 15 men to roll it downhill into a trough in front of the tomb. He rolled that away and then he played Chuck Norris for a while and he beat up those 15 to 16 guards that were there. And then he walked with those nail pierced heels an estimated 14 miles back to Jerusalem. Now how much weight would you think that would hold up in court? But no, we know he died. We know they put his body in the ground. We know they wrapped it for burial but we know on the third grave, the stone was not just rolled away. It was sitting way over to the side because God Almighty is the one that moved the stone. The, the linen pieces that wrapped his body were folded neatly in the tomb when they arrived at the tomb and it was empty. Why? Because he really did die and he really did rise from the grave. So the first proof we have is that they buried him. When he showed himself later, he died rose from the grave. Number two, the tomb was empty. We ought to be really thankful the tomb was empty. Because every other religion besides Christianity bases their fact on a person that's still in the grave. And you can go to the grave and you can find them. You can find Muhammad. You can f find every person that everybody's worship, but you can't find the one true God, Jesus Christ, because he's no longer in the grave. Matthew 28, verse 12 was on the PowerPoint behind me. I referenced the verse in your handout. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers, 14 of them that were there, and said, tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now let's go back to a court of law. This is funny to me. Tell them y'all were sleeping and that the disciples came and stole the body while you were sleeping. Well, if you were sleeping, how do you know they stole his body? That would really hold up in court. And plus, their punishment for sleeping after the seal was put on it would be death. And they didn't kill those soldiers because those soldiers didn't sleep. Interesting. You gotta ask yourself the question, why would the chief priest come up with this kind of story? because they know the tomb is empty and they've got to prove it away somehow. Because if the tomb is empty, then God raised his son from the dead and they killed his son and they have to admit that 
Or they can explain it away some other way, which means we're going to say somebody else came and stole his body. Let's look at each scenario. Let's say his friends, Jesus' disciples, stole his body. Let's look at the obstacles to that possibility. First obstacle for the disciples to steal Jesus' body were the soldiers guarding the tomb. These were the elite Roman soldiers. They were the special forces, if you will. There were 16, 14 to 16 scholars say, well-trained, highly disciplined men carrying a six-foot spear, a three-foot sword, and a dagger on one side. Now, remember what happened to the disciples just a few hours before. They're running for their life. Peter can't even stand up to a little girl in the courtyard and say he's a follower of Jesus. But all of a sudden, these disciples got courageous and they overtook these special forces, these trained military men to take the body of Jesus. Second obstacle would be with stone that was rolled in front of the tomb. Again, it was rolled downhill, down a trough in front of the tomb. It would have taken 14 to 16 of those soldiers to roll that two to three ton stone into place. How many more would it take to roll it back uphill? So these disciples overtook the guards, then had no problem moving the stone. The third obstacle would be the Roman seal that was placed on the tomb. Once that seal was in place, the Roman guards once again knew if the seal was broken, it would cost them their very life. History tells us that the Roman soldiers that allowed a Roman seal to be broken because of their negligence would be burned to death with their clothes on. Now, how much evidence would this hold up in court if the soldiers came and said, their little plan, disciples stole his body? Well, let's take it the other way. Let's say the soldier stole his body. Let's say the enemy stole his body. Well, as soon as they started claiming that Jesus rose from the grave, they could disprove that real quick and just go get the body. Here's his body. He didn't rise from the grave. When Acts 1-3 tells us there's overwhelming proof that Jesus rose from the grave, God gave us that proof so we could not hope he rose from the grave, that we can know he rose from the grave. Hope is a certainty. It's a, a surety. I love the third proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lives were transformed. Only God, a risen Savior, can transform lives. Back to Acts 1, verse 3. Jesus, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. If you put this, all of God's word together, Jesus appeared on 10 different occasions after he rose from the grave over about six weeks to 516 witnesses. He appeared in the morning, afternoon, evening. He appeared inside. He appeared outside. Now, act like you're in a court of law again and we're giving evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If each of those 516 witnesses gave a 30-minute testimony, there'd be over 250 hours of testimony all collaborating the same thing that Jesus rose from the grave. The evidence is overwhelming. Why? Because Jesus wanted the evidence to be overwhelming. So he could know for sure that he rose from the grave. Think about that first Easter. Those disciples on that first Easter were dejected when Jesus died on the cross. They didn't understand. They thought he was going to usher in some political kingdom, some political government rule, and they were going to reign with him in that government rule. But now he's dead. And they're running for their very lives. But when he appears to them over and over and over again, now these disciples know that Jesus is the Lord. He is the Savior. And their lives are radically transformed. They go from being scared to being bold for Jesus Christ. They go from living for themselves to denying everything that they had. And every one of them, except arguably John on the Isle of Patmos, suffered horrific deaths after Jesus Christ rose in the grave because they knew it was true. No one will willingly die for something they know is a lie. 
Some people today, Muslims today, some people will die for something they believe is true, but nobody will die for something that they know is not true. And the disciples knew that Jesus really did die and he really rose from the grave. They knew it without a shadow of a doubt. So every one of them lived a transformed life because of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the fourth one has a great impact for us this morning, the church. The fourth proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the birth of the church. Because the Sabbath used to be Saturday. And for some people it still is, and that, that's okay. But we worship on a Sunday because the church started worshiping on Sunday. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. And every Sunday is Easter Sunday, and every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. So the church was born, and the church spread. Why? Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is real. It's true. Now, if you look it up in the Guinness Book of World Records, I started to put Gary on the spot, but I'm sure Gary would know who this is. The most successful attorney in history is named Sir Lionel Luckhoo. He succeeded in getting 245 consecutive murder acquittals. He was so successful, again, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records, but he's so successful, Queen Elizabeth knighted him twice for being what's considered the greatest lawyer ever. He took all the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he did a study on it. This is the greatest lawyer supposed to ever walk to face the earth. And here's what Lionel Luck, who concluded from all the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. He said it would hold up in a court of law over and over and over again. Why? Because it's not just hearsay. There's too many proofs that Jesus did die, that the tomb was empty, and that he had to rise from the grave. But anybody who does not want to believe in God, who chooses to believe in something else, has to try to find some way to explain away the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't want to believe what is obviously true. If you have Acts 1 open, this is not on the screen, but look at verses 12 and following of Acts chapter 1. Then they returned to Jerusalem, this is after the resurrection, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Now these are the disciples there. Verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. They go from running in every direction to Jesus appearing to them, to them going to the upper room because of that appearance and many appearances, to now they're devoted themselves to prayer. Why? Because they know Jesus is real now. They've seen him risen from the grave and they know he said to pray and keep watch because I'm gonna usher in the Holy Spirit very soon. So they're gathered together, they're devoted. Why? Because they truly believe Jesus did not stay in the tomb, that he really did rise from the grave. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe in it with everything in my being. I believe there's no shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ truly rose from the grave. And if you believe that, here's the last part of the message. Why is that important to us? Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ arguably the most important part of the gospel? Number one, without it, we have no forgiveness of sins. Romans 4, 25. Romans 4, 25. Who was delivered up, Jesus, for our trespasses, and notice this next phrase, and raised for our justification. We are justified. We are declared not guilty. We are forgiven of our sins. Why? Because Jesus was raised from the dead. The New Living Translation says it this way. He was handed over to die because of our sins and was raised to life to make us right with God. We can't be right with God. We can't have forgiveness of sins. We can't be justified if Jesus did not truly rise from the grave. 
You know, it's interesting. Anybody could claim to die for our sins. Any mortal being could say, I'm going to die for your sins and be killed and go into the grave. How do we know it's really paying for our sins? When that person proves their God by rising back from the grave. When that person says, the sacrifice has been accepted by my father and the proof of that is I'm really God and I will show you by conquering death and coming back to life. Romans 1 verse 4. And was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. Now notice this. How was Jesus declared to be the son of God? By his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. If he didn't rise from the grave, he's just a human being who claimed to die for our sins. And when he died, that was it. But we know it went more than that. We know it went well beyond that. We know that Jesus is God's only son. It's the Lord himself who was crucified, who was dead, who was buried, but on the third day came back to life so that we could have real life. Number two, why is the resurrection important? For justification, for forgiveness of sins. Number two, it gives your life and my life real purpose. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your life has no purpose. But if Jesus Christ really did die and was raised from the grave, and I believe so, then this is not all there is to this life. There's so much more. Life's not about just going to work and getting through Friday and getting to the weekend and have to go back to work again and getting older and then one day you die and you go on. That's people that have no purpose in life. But because Jesus really did conquer death, because the grave could not hold him, my life and your life has real purpose because we're not living for the here and now. We're living for the day we'll see him in all of his glory face to face and worship him for all eternity. We're not spending everything that's important for this world. We're spending what's most important for the world to come. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life and have it to the fullest or have it abundantly. We can only enjoy real life now because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number three. You got to love this one. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is important because it gives us victory over death. The grave could not hold Jesus and therefore, the grave will not be the end for those who believe in Jesus. We will live in glory with him forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 54, a verse I use often at the funeral of a precious saint in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. When the perishable put on the imperishable and the mortal put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you were clapping when we got through singing victory in Jesus. That's why you were clapping while we were singing a so slow song that's hard to clap to, okay? Because there's victory in Jesus. There's victory over death. Verse 58 of 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore... My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing certainty that in the Lord your work or labor is not in vain. We work for the Lord. We are steadfast. We're immovable. Why? Because Christ really did rise from the grave, and we really, truly do have victory over death. That should be important to Everybody, everybody in this room that's had a loved one that knows the Lord pass away. We know when we die, if we're truly believers in the Lord, that we still have hope even through death. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. And the fourth one ties into victory over death. The fourth reason that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is of utmost importance is eternal life with God. You cannot receive eternal life with God and go to heaven unless Jesus Christ 
was raised from the dead, and unless you believe, you place your trust in him, that he really has been risen from the grave. Evidence of that in the scripture, Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, what? That God raised him from the dead, you will, not maybe, you will be saved. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important unless we believe that God really did that and place our trust in him because he did that, we cannot be saved and have eternal life in heaven with God. When you explore the evidence, there's only one obvious decision based on the evidence that Jesus Christ did die. They put him in the ground, they put him in the tomb, and on the third day, he rose back to life. The evidence is overwhelming. Brother Jim, God's used in so many ways over the last almost 41 years he's been here. I've been able to come to many funeral services that Jim's led in and I've noticed of the many funeral services because God's used Jim to impact so many lives of so many families here at First Baptist Church. I've noticed that one of the favorite verses Brother Jim has at funeral services is John 11, 25, and 26. That's a great favorite verse to have. Listen to it. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I really did rise from the grave, Jesus says. I'm really the author of life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die and notice the last phrase in verse 26 do you believe this I believe I believe I have hope even in death that Jesus conquered death and that I too though I die physically I will still live and my body will be resurrected. My soul will be forever with God. Why? Because scripture gives me too much evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The true gospel has to involve the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can't claim to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and leave out the most important parts of the gospel. If Jesus didn't die, for our sins, then the wrath of God was not poured out on him. Satisfaction wasn't made for our sins, and we're going to have to go to hell forever and pay for them. Unless Jesus Christ truly did die, he could not rise from the grave. And unless Jesus Christ rises from the grave, we have no victory over sin. We have no forgiveness over sin. We have no hope when we die. But I'm thankful I don't have to hope that took place. I know that took place. And Jesus himself says, do you believe this? I believe. I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. I believe that he was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day, he rose back to life. I truly believe that. Not because it's in the Apostles' Creed, because God said it himself in his holy word. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 9, you confess your sins with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Turn from your sins, place your trust in Christ, truly believe that he did rise from the grave because he really did, and you can be saved even at this very moment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.